Nanny history with the British soldiers, Eagle Eye drones, Gun Hill in Flagstaff, Maroon Town. Slavery on the colony of Jamaica and established communities of free black people in the island's mountainous interior, primarily in the eastern parishes. By 1530, slave revolts had broken out in Mexico, Hezbollah, and Panama. The Spanish called these free slaves maroons, a word derived from cimarron, which means fierce or unruly. Rather than become slaves to new masters, vast numbers of enslaved Spanish people took this opportunity to join the maroons in the hill country. The maroons have escaped enslaved people. They ran away from their Spanish-owned plantations when the British took the Caribbean island of Jamaica from Spain in 1655. The word maroon comes from the Spanish word cimarrones, which means mountaineers. They fled to the mountainous areas of Jamaica, where it was difficult for their owners to follow and catch them, and formed independent communities as free men and women. As more slaves were imported from Africa to work on the developing sugar plantations, and the population of enslaved Africans grew in Jamaica, there were more rebellions by the enslaved people. Some rebel enslaved people disappeared into the mountains and joined the Maroon communities. As the Maroon population grew, the Jamaican government decided to defeat the Maroons once and for all. They were seen as a constant threat by the government. The first Maroon War began in 1728. The campaign against them made the Maroons more determined than ever. Under their leader called Kujo, the Maroons fought back. In 1739, the British and the Maroons made peace. The freedom of the Maroons was recognized, and their land was given to them. The Maroons were to govern themselves. In return, they would support the British government in Jamaica against the foreign invasion and help capture rebel enslaved people and runaways from the plantations and return them to their owners. Although this agreement might seem strange, now, now it was one way for the Maroons to live peacefully with the island's so government. Pictured here is a giant tidal pacification with the Maroons in 1801. It is an imaginary view of a meeting between British soldiers and Maroons. It is unclear whether it is meant to be of the 1739 or the 1795 peace agreement. The leaders of the Maroons did lead British officers to accept peace. Agreement yeah. This is there the were many years of peace between the Maroons you know? and the British yeah. in Jamaica. Yes, so big up but in 1795, yes, no. the new governor of Jamaica, Val Cars, yes, decided to deal with some minor breaches right. of the peace know. treaty by a community this of Maroons called the Jolani Town Maroons. 
the plantation owners asked the governor not to take action. They felt that an agreement should be reached with them. Maroons to maintain the town's peace. The governor went ahead against this advice, arresting several of the leaders of Trelawney Town. This started the Second Maroon War. 300 Maroons in Trelawney Town held out against 1,500 troops and 3,000 local volunteer troops. After five months of fighting, the undefeated Maroons were offered an agreement for peace. When they surrendered their arms, the governor cheated on the peace agreement. Because you don't know. So this is all the soldiers. How much soldier, my brother? Huh? Yeah, 100 soldiers. And then he kill off and end up and end up um send back one to go and tell the message so all these are the british soldiers yeah you see me yeah man so we show you gonzalez hill and now these are the soldiers that dead off the british and jamaican did in a war in those ancient times everybody about nanny so right now we mount you know what i mean well Kojo and the whole of them there, you know what I mean? Yeah, man, so you don't know. You have to walk through that one, I couldn't leave it, my friend. So these are all the British soldiers, them that you hear in the story of the book when Nanny kill off and actually lay to rest here in Jamaica. So all these graves are the British soldiers lay to rest, you don't know. Yeah, man, so. When I hear about it, check out the history of Jamaica and up here is Maroon Town Flagstaff. Right? Flagstaff in Maroon Town. Not the one not the not the Maroon Town here up in um a Kong Kong Town. This is the Flagstaff Maroon Town, you know. This is the real Maroon place. So you don't know. Right, see two more than so. Yeah man. One hundred soldier. 99 dead and one go back home, you see me? Yeah man, so check it out, check out on the history. If you don't know, Eagle Eye Jones here view bringing it live. You know, you see it? Yes man, so all these are British soldiers. 100 of them, 99 well far back. And the one lucky maybe in dead and bury one another place. Gun Hill, you see me? So we do an interview on Gun Hill. Yeah, and we're gonna actually build this with it so hopefully you know don't forget to like this page and subscribe yeah these are the soldiers them man the to the mid 18th the century the, big the maroons fall, developed into a formidable force that gun. significantly challenged right? the system of enslavement yeah, imposed by the english though great controversy up, surrounds the terms of the treaties that they signed these, with the yes, english the their soldiers, role in undermining institutionalized that, slavery that and cultural traditions are prominent of time, parts of the right? history so, and heritage of jamaica know. the maroons and their know. fight for no, freedom no. the english took possession of the island from the spanish in 1655 however fighting continued for approximately five years during this period the spanish fresh, you know, had managed to fresh, secure the help of some of them you know, maroons to natives and africans you in order to reclaim possession of the island fly, right? so, still their efforts to die. recapture it ultimately like proved futile them, so despite the resulting walk. decline so of the maroon population the they posed go. a severe challenge Love to the english significantly as the system of enslavement expanded and an increasing number of british-owned enslaved africans fled the plantations and joined existing Maroon communities. The Maroons used various strategies to maintain their freedom and undermine the constant threat that the English posed. They would escape to mainly the cockpit country, that is, inaccessible and remote parts of the island where it was hilly and densely vegetated and established communities, which the English frequently disrupted. The Maroons have been divided into two groupings. Based on their location, windward and leeward, the windward Maroons were located in the east of the island, while the leeward Maroons occupied the western part of the island. The leeward Maroons include Trelawney Town in St. James and Akampong in St. Elizabeth. Among the windward settlements are Moore and Charlestown in Portland, Nannytown in St. Thomas, and Scotts Hall in St. Mary. Even with 
these groupings, the Maroons were organized into different bands. Such organization facilitated their mobilization. In fighting for and maintaining their freedom, both the Leeward and Windward Maroons displayed highly skillful tactics, which proved most challenging for the English. Richard Price has given a vivid description of this, to the bewilderment of their European enemies, whose rigid and conventional tactics were learned on the open battlefields of Europe, these highly adaptable and mobile warriors took maximum advantage of local environments, striking and withdrawing with great rapidity, making extensive uses of ambushes to catch their adversaries in the crossfire, fighting only when and where they chose, depending on intelligence networks among non-Maroons. The Maroon Wars, the English and the Maroons were engaged in two wars throughout their struggle. Maroon oral history suggests that the first Maroon War, as it is called, began around 1655, spanning approximately 84 years, while records from the colonial archives indicate that its duration was about 10 years. The war emanated from the fight between the English and the Spanish over control of the island, which lasted for five years. After the defeat of the Spanish by the English, the Maroons who had helped the Spanish continued to confront the English. The war took an irregular course, occurring intermittently, and both the English and the Maroons struggled to suppress each other. However, the Maroons, as many, if not most historians have concluded, were more successful in concealing their opponent. They would raid the settlements of the English at rapid speed, after which they would quickly depart to inaccessible places, hilly and mountainous paths. They were more familiar with and knowledgeable about these conditions than the English were, and this made Chase very difficult and significantly contributed to their success in battle. In 1734, the English captured a major Maroon settlement, Nanny Town, which dealt a blow to the Windward Maroons. Nonetheless, this did not ensure their defeat or suppression. Kerry Robinson has noted that, within 40 years of the first struggle between the Maroons and the English, the assembly was to pass 44 acts and spend 240,000 in its attempts at suppression. Also, Brian Edwards, prominent planter slash historian of the time, wrote that they plundered all around them, and caused several plantations to be thrown up and abandoned, and prevented many valuable tracts of land from being cultivated, to the great prejudice and diminution of his majesty revenue, as well as of the trade, navigation, and consumption of British manufacturers, and to the manifest weakening, and preventing the further increase of the strength and inhabitants in the island. The Maroons were persistent in fighting and were offered to sign a peace treaty by the English. The first Maroon treaty was signed by the fiercely word Maroon leader, Kujo, on March 1, 1739. This treaty that Kujo signed did not apply to the Maroon community in its entirety as the Windward Maroons were not involved in the process and were possibly unaware of such occurrences. They maintained their defense. However, not long after that, four months, they were also offered to sign a treaty by the English. The English had made five attempts to sign this treaty which was eventually signed by the Windward Maroon leader, Quayo, on December 23, 1739. As a result of a divide between the Windward Maroons, another treaty was signed a year later by Nanny, perhaps the most celebrated leader of the Moortown Maroons. Both the Leeward and Windward Maroon treaties serve to grant the Maroons freedom, alleviate them, and remove a significant obstacle to the institution of slavery that the English created. The Leeward Treaty, which contained 15 articles, was as follows, that all hostilities shall cease on both sides forever that the said Captain Kujo, the rest of his captains, adherents, and men, shall be forever hereafter in a perfect state of freedom and liberty, excepting those who they have taken, or fled to them within the two years last past, if such are willing to return to their said masters and owners, with full pardon and indemnity from their masters and owners for what is past, provided always, that if they are not willing to return, they shall remain in subjection to Captain to Captain Kujo, and in friendship with us, according to the form and tenor of this treaty, that they shall enjoy and possess for themselves and posterity forever, all the lands situate and lying between Trelawney Town and the Cockpits, to the amount of 1500 acres, bearing northwest from the said Trelawney Town, that they shall have liberty to plant the said lands with coffee, ginger, tobacco, and cotton, breed cattle, hogs, goats, or any other stock, and dispose of the produce or increase of the said commodities to the inhabitants of this island. Provided always, when they bring the said commodities to market, 
they shall apply first to the Custos, or any other magistrate of the respective parishes where they expose their goods to sale, for license to vend the same, that Captain Cudjo, and all his adherents, and people not in subjection to him, shall all live together within the bounds of Trelawney Town, and that they have liberty to hunt where they shall think fit, except within three miles of any settlement, crawl or pen. Provided always, that in case the hunters of Captain Cudjo, and those of other settlements meet, then the hogs to be equally divided between both parties. That said, Captain Cudjo and his successors, do use their best endeavors to take, kill, suppress, or destroy, either by themselves or jointly, with any other number of men commanded by that service by His Excellency the Governor or Commander-in-Chief, for the time being, all rebels wherever they are throughout this island, unless they submit to the same terms of accommodation granted to Captain Cudjo, and his successors, that in case this island is invaded by any foreign enemy, the said Captain Cudjo, and his successors herein and after named, or to be appointed, shall then, upon notice given, immediately repair to any place the governor, for the time being, shall establish, to repel the said invaders with his or their utmost force, and to submit to the orders of the commander-in-chief on that occasion, that if any white man shall do any manner of injury to Captain Cudjo, his successors, or any of his people, they shall apply to any commanding officer or magistrate in the neighborhood for justice, and in case Captain Cudjo, or any of his people, shall do any injury to any white person, he shall submit himself or deliver up such offenders to justice that if any Negroes shall hereafter run away from their master or owners and fall into Captain Cudjo Isle's hands, they shall immediately be sent back to the chief magistrate of the next parish where they are taken, and those that bring them are to be satisfied for their trouble, as legislature shall appoint, that all Negroes taken since the raising of this party by Captain Cudjo I one half s people, shall immediately be returned that Captain Cudjo, and his successors, shall wait on His Excellency, or the Commander-in-Chief, for the time being, every year, if thereunto required, that Captain Cudjo, during his life, and the captains succeeding him, shall have full power to inflict any punishment they think proper for crimes committed by their men among themselves, death only excepted, in which case, if the captain believes they deserve death, he shall be obliged to bring them before any justice of the peace, who shall order proceedings on their trial equal to those of other free Negroes, that Captain Cudjo with his people shall cut, clear, and keep open, large, and convenient roads from Trelawney Town to Westmoreland and St. James, and if possible to St. Elizabeth, that two white men to be nominated by His Excellency, or the Commander-in-Chief, for the time being, shall constantly live and reside with Captain Cudjo and his successors, in order to maintain a friendly correspondence with the inhabitants of this island. That Captain Cudjo shall, during his life, be commander in Trelawney Town, after his decease the command to devolve of his brother Captain Akampong, and in case of his decease, on his next brother Captain Johnny, and, failing him, Captain Cuffy shall succeed who is to be achieved by Captain Quacko, and after all their demises, the governor or commander-in-chief, for the time being, shall appoint from time to time whom he thinks fit for that command. The Windward Treaty comprised 14 articles are, that all hostilities shall cease on both sides forever, amen. That the, said Captain Quayo, and his people, shall have a certain quantity of land given to them, in order to raise provisions, hogs, fowls, goats, or whatever flock they may think proper, sugar canes excepted, saving for their hogs, and to have the liberty to sell the same. That four white men shall constantly live and reside with them in their town, to keep a good correspondence with the inhabitants of this island. That the said Captain Quayo, and his people, shall be ready on all commands the governor, or the commander-in-chief, for the time being, shall send him, to suppress and destroy all other party or parties of rebellious negroes, that now are or from time to time gather together to settle in any part of this island, and shall bring in such other negroes as shall from time to time run away, from their respective owners, from the date of these articles, that the said Captain Quayo, and his people, shall also be ready to assist His Excellency the Governor for the time being, in case of any invasion, and shall put himself, with all his people that can bear arms, under the command of the general or commander of such forces, appointed by His Excellency to defend the island from the said invasion, that the said Captain Quayo, and all his people, shall be in subjection to His Excellency, the governor for the time being, and the said Captain Quayo shall, 
once every year or oftener, appear before the governor, if they're unto required. That in case any of the hunters belonging to the inhabitants of this island, and the hunters belonging to Captain Queo, should meet in order to hinder disputes, Captain Queo will order his people to let the inhabitants hunters have the hawk, that in case Captain Queo, or his people, shall take up runaway negroes that shall abscond from their respective owners, and shall be paid for so doing as the legislature shall appoint, that in case Captain Queo, and his people, should be disturbed by a more significant number of rebels than he can fight, that then he shall be assisted by as many white people as the governor, for the time being, shall think proper, that in case any of the negroes belonging o Captain Queo shall be guilty of any crime or crimes that may deserve death, he shall deliver him up to the next magistrate, in order to be tried as other negroes are, but minor offenses he may punish himself, that in case any white man, or other the inhabitants of this island, shall disturb or annoy any of the people, hogs, flock, or whatever goods may belong to the said Captain Queo, or any of his people, when they come down to the settlements to vent the same, upon due complaint made to a magistrate, he or they shall have justice done them. Neither Captain Queo, nor any of his people, shall bring any hogs, fowls, or any stock or provisions, to sell to the inhabitants without a ticket from under the hand of one or more of the white men residing in their town. That Captain Queo, nor any of his people, shall hunt within three miles of any settlement. That in case Captain Queo should die, that then the command of his people shall descend to Captain Tomboy, and at his death to descend to Captain Apong, and at his end Captain Blackwell shall succeed and that his death clash shall succeed, and, when he dies, the governor or commander-in-chief, for the time being, shall appoint whom he thinks proper. After ratifying both treaties, the Maroons had a relatively peaceful existence until July of 1795, when the Second Maroon War broke out. This arose from mounting grievances the Trelawney town Maroons had with the British, but, what ignited the war was the flogging of two Maroons convicted of stealing pigs by a runaway slave they had returned to the authorities in adherence with one of the articles of the treaties. These Maroons, it is believed, were angered by the conviction and flogging as they felt that they should have been the ones to try the accused and punish them. Besides, they felt undignified because the flogging was done by a runaway slave they had handed over to the authorities. The British authorities tried to quell the rebellion by meeting the Maroons, but this proved to be unsuccessful as they were dissatisfied with the demands of the British. As a consequence, they continued the war. Governor Lord Balcares ordered the Maroons to capitulate by August 12th, but only a small number of the older Maroons did. The others persisted and brought about considerable damages and losses upon British property and troops, but eventually surrendered to the British on the March 6, 1796 because they were significantly outnumbered by British soldiers, hunted by specially trained dogs from Cuba, and other Maroons. Moreover, it is said that they were enticed into capitulation through the proposal of another treaty by the governor. The end of the war was officially declared on March 16, 1796, and on June 6, over 500 Maroons were deported to Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. The Maroons and Jamaican heritage arguably, the most outstanding feature and personage of Maroons' existence that is a part of the heritage of Jamaica is the settlements they established during the period of enslavement, and Nanny, one of the leaders of the Windward Maroons. Maroon settlements that have survived include, a compong in St. Elizabeth, Moore, and Charlestown in Portland, and Scotts Hall in St. Mary. These communities still, to a great extent, maintain the culture of their forebearers, despite some amount of assimilation into the wider Jamaican society. The communities have their own leaders who are referred to as colonels historically. Their traditions are predominantly African-based, especially from the Akan region. It is a standard view that most of the original Maroons were Coromantes, natives of the Akan area. Among these traditions are, the ambush dance, myalism, and an African-based pidgin language. Other elements of their practices include jerk pork, and the use of rum and pigs for rituals. Ilka Jo, Queo, Akampong, and Kofi among other. Maroon leaders, are often mentioned in discussions of Maroon history, and celebratory activities. However, only the female Maroon leader, Nanny, has acquired a superior position in the heritage of Jamaica. Nanny is known for her elusive presence, fierceness in battle, and Obia skills attracted much attention. Nanny's existence has often been questioned because of her elusiveness, and the 
Incredible obia works she performed have also attracted debate. Nonetheless, some accounts speak to this. In memoirs and anecdotes of Philip Thickness late lieutenant governor, for instance, reference is made to Nanny as, the old hag had a girdle round her waist with, I speak within compass, nine or ten different knives hanging in sheets to it, many of which I have no doubt, had been plunged. In human flesh and blood. Today, Nanny is the only Maroon leader who has ascended to the rank of national hero, the most significant recognition given by the country, and one that has earned her a spot on the Jamaican $500. Last in 1796, following a series of wars with the colonial government in Jamaica, a group of Maroons was deported to Nova Scotia, while Maroon communities were only in Nova Scotia for four years before being sent to Sierra Leone, their legacy lives on. The Maroons were also notorious for raiding plantations for weapons and food, burning them down, and leading freed slaves to join their mountain communities. Maroons played a critical and influencing role as catalysts in the Haitian Revolution, which resulted in the creation of the America's first free nation. Additionally, the Maroons were well known for raiding and torching sugar plantations, and leading freed slaves to join their communities in the hills of Jamaica. The Maroons have shown their ingenuity, fortitude, and mysticism, and these characteristics are credited to the Maroon legacy. The Maroon legacy is credited with ingenuity, fortitude, and mysticism demonstrated by Jamaicans such as Bob Marley, Usain Bolt, Marcus Garvey, and Nanny, an 18th century Maroon strategist. History with the British soldiers, eagle-eyed drones, gun and flagstaff maroon towers.